Yes, Ms Richards. So I should explain, for the benefit of those who weren't here yesterday um, or who are watching remotely, um, I am still part way through the presentation on the knowledge of risk, and we've reached April 1983. Um, that will probably take most of the rest of the morning, uh, and then um, I will turn to the presentation in relation to Professor Bloom and the Cardiff Haemophilia Centre. Um, there won't be any shortening of what is going to be presented in relation to, to Professor Bloom and Cardiff. We won't finish it today, but it will then continue on to next Wednesday, on, on next Wednesday. Um, so I just wanted to add that reassurance. I understand that there are people watching from Cardiff or from Wales um, who would obviously want to, to know those timings. So we will we will start again after today uh, at 10 o'clock on Wednesday. With Professor Bloom resuming with, with the, 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 the Professor balance Bloom of Cardiff. the presentation. Yes, and then we'll finish that on Wednesday, and, and we probably should also finish uh, the material relating to Oxford. If for any reason we don't, we'll simply carry that over to the following week when, um, when there is next a presentation. We won't be yes, cutting it, into it, any it, of the It is important, witnesses. particularly for those, for those who, who uh, had their treatment at those centres, that uh, we don't cut it uh, any shorter than you had originally planned. Absolutely, and we won't. So, so when we finished yesterday, we had broadcast an extract from a BBC documentary called Killer in the Village, which looked at uh, uh, the developing knowledge in relation to AIDS um, and the awareness uh, uh, of it affecting haemophiliacs. That was followed by a series of, newspa a series of journal and newspaper articles in, in the United Kingdom. Henry, could we have, please, PRSE... 40317. This is one of a series of articles published in The Lancet. Uh, I think the date is the 30th of April 1983. We can see it's called Acquired Immunodeficiency in an Infant, Possible Transmission by Means of Blood Products. Uh, and it refers to the case of an infant receiving multiple transfusions and then becoming ill with recurrent uh, infections in the summary. And if we could go, please, Henry, to page three. Just a little bit further down. Thank you. Um, the concluding paragraph of the article reads this. Although AIDS is a consequence of a transmissible infectious agent cannot be definitely proven in this patient, the evidence strongly suggests such a possibility. Future prospective studies should attempt to determine the incidence of AIDS in transfused patients, especially newborn and premature infants, immunosuppressed in patients, and patients receiving multiple blood products. As no diagnostic test is available for AIDS, serious consideration should be given to avoiding the use of blood products obtained from individuals with the potential to transmit AIDS. A disturbing observation in this report is that the platelet donor was healthy and did not become ill with AIDS until seven months after donation. Now, this is the San Francisco baby. Yes, in all likelihood. But this is the English or uh, Lancet report of what was reported four months earlier in uh, the States. Precisely. So whether or not it had um, uh, been picked up by, un by clinicians based in this country looking at American journals... We, we may not know, but this is The Lancet, obviously one of the leading medical publications in this country, reporting this case in April 1983, only a few days after the BBC had aired a documentary uh, which touched on the topic. Yeah, and the importance of this is the, the comment to which you've drawn our attention. Yes. Uh, and then we see the issue being picked up in um, the mainstream media. Henry, could we have PRSE 40199, please? This is the Mail on Sunday, on the 1st of May 1983, hospitals using killer blood. Blood imported by the NHS from America could be threatening the lives of thousands of British people. A sexually transmitted killer disease, which has struck more than 1,300 Americans, is present in contaminated blood used in transfusions and operations. Experts revealed exclusively to the Mail on Sunday that two men in hospital in London and Cardiff are suspected to be suffering from the disease after routine transfusions for haemophilia. Uh, and then if we go down a little further, please, Henry, um, we see uh, um, uh, 
a, a quote from a Dr. Tony Pinching, an immunologist at St. Mary's Hospital London, it seems madness that our blood supplies are coming from a country suffering from an epidemic of an incurable killer disease that nobody can even test for. Uh, the Swiss Red Cross chief producer in Switzerland of the anti-clotting factor needed by haemophiliacs said this weekend they would welcome requests from Britain for clean plasma. So we, we've gone from the BBC through to the Lancet through now to the Mail on Sunday. Uh, and the same date, 1st of May, if we just look at one further example, there are a number of articles at, at that, that weekend. MDIA 5015, please, Henry. This is the observer, the same day, the epidemic spreads. And if we could pick it up at the bottom of the left-hand column, first of all. Um, thanks, Amy. However, incidents of the disease over the past 18 months among 200 drug abusers and 11 haemophiliacs has strengthened suspicions that AIDS could also be passed on through blood, either via, if we go to the next, top of the next column, mm. infected needles, or through blood products such as those used by haemophiliacs to prevent bleeding, which may contain blood pulled from up to 1,000 donors. And then if we scroll down a little further, please, Henry. Um, the blood theory gained credibility a few months ago when a San Franciscan baby boy who received massive blood transfusion shortly after birth began to show early signs of AIDS at four months uh, later. Uh, and then there is further reference to the case of the San Francisco baby. So again, mainstream media uh, uh, in the United Kingdom picking up the story. Um, there, there are other articles um, in The Guardian as well, which I won't go to. Um, that was the 1st of May. We're then going to look at some Department of Health documents on the 3rd of May. Henry, could we have DHSC 301651, please? Can we have the first page? Thank you. So we can see from this, uh, it's a... A um, minute dated the 3rd of May 1983. Uh, it's headed Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome at AIDS. You'll recall we were asked to provide briefing for Prime Minister's questions on the stories which appeared over the weekend about AIDS, and we've just looked at a couple of those stories. I attach a copy of the line to take, which went to number 10, together with a background note mm. written in supplementary question and answer form, both of which I'm circulating more widely uh, within the office. Officials are in touch with representatives of directors of haemophilia centres uh, and the Blood Transfusion Service as well as the Haemophilia Society. Uh, the Haemophilia Society indicated they would welcome an opportunity to discuss AIDS with ministers by the end of the week. Whilst one of the main purposes of the background briefing is to put the problem of AIDS into proper perspective, a view shared by the society, we think it would be helpful if Mr Finsberg were to offer to meet representatives of the society. Meanwhile, there appears to be little to be gained from ministers issuing statements about a matter which has been sensationalised and in some cases distorted by the media and on which, with the present state of knowledge, there is no immediate action which ministers could be advised to take. We should, however, review this line after officials' discussions are complete. And then there's a reference to whether to have a meeting with the Haemophilia Society. Could we go to the next page, please? This was the line to take that was drafted for number 10. I was very concerned to read this weekend's press reports and can well understand the anxiety which some sensational reports may have caused. It is important to put this in perspective. There is as yet no conclusive proof that AIDS has been transmitted from American blood products. The risk that these products may transmit the disease must be balanced against the obvious risks to haemophiliacs of withdrawing a major source of supplies, Already in this country, there is a special surveillance system established by the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre to monitor the occurrence of AIDS in collaboration with the Centres for Disease Control in the USA. Every opportunity is being taken for this country to learn from the experience of this disease in the USA. And so you will see there the formulation that is then repeated on a number of occasions over the course of the year uh, from uh, the department no conclusive proof that AIDS has been transmitted from American blood products. Uh, and, of course, one question which you will no doubt wish to consider in due course is whether that was the right question to be asking. Uh, could, we will just look at the briefing note that's also referred to in this uh, minute. 
Uh, Henry, could we have DHSC 301654, please? So we can see here um, uh, uh, the reference to what is AIDS, the reference to the symptoms, and then under the heading who is at risk from AIDS, uh, the disease occurred predominantly in homosexual males, but other groups such as mainline drug abusers, Haitian immigrants, and haemophiliacs requiring treatment with anti-haemophilic factor concentrates have also been identified as being at increased risk. Is it caused by a virus? The cause is unknown. Although medical opinion is tending to favour a virus as the agent responsible, there is no proof that this is the case. There is no means of testing for the presence of AIDS in patients or in blood or blood products, such as factor VIII. Uh, then there's a reference to laboratory tests for AIDS. Uh, and then if we go down to mortality, the mortality from the established disease is high. At least 40% of cases die after a variable period of months or years after contracting the disease. And then if we just go on to the next... Is it transmitted in blood or blood products? As yet, there is no conclusive proof that AIDS is transmitted by blood as well, as well as by homosexual contact. But the evidence is suggestive that this is likely to be the case. The evidence relates to some 11 haemophiliacs in the USA and three in Spain in whom the most likely explanation for the development of AIDS was their exposure to American factor VIII concentrates. There is also some evidence that AIDS has been transmitted to babies in blood transfusions. Are there any cases of AIDS in UK haemophiliacs? As far as can be established, there are no proven cases of AIDS in UK haemophiliacs. There is a suspect case in Cardiff of whom we have details, and of course that will be of particular significance when you come to consider the decisions and actions of, of Professor Bloom. But the reported in the Sunday Mail case in London has not yet been traced. The case in Cardiff has not received any American factor rate concentrates since 1980. Pausing there, said so that would suggest there'd been some form of communication between the Department of Health and uh, Professor Bloom or Cardiff in order for them to have that information. This would not exonerate factor, American Factor 8 because of the long incubation period, which there may be between exposure to the agent and the manifestation of the disease. On the other hand, the patient who's a severe haemophiliac has received since 1980 a great deal of British-made Factor 8 concentrate, and it's not possible to know whether British concentrate may contain the AIDS agent. Should a ban be placed on imports of US factor VIII concentrate, at present haemophilia experts in this country take the view that to ban the imports of US factor VIII would be to place haemophiliacs at greater risk from bleeding than they would be from acquiring AIDS. Should we switch to European countries? Concentrates. AIDS has been reported in some European countries so that European plasma may not be free of the agent. Moreover, there is evidence that some European manufacturers may use plasma, which comes not from Europe, but from Latin Amer America. What action are we taking? And then there's a reference to discussions from the blood transfusion directors. Uh, and then all haemophilia centre directors have received instructions to report any suspect case of AIDS, both to a monitoring centre um, for AIDS at the if you run on, Oxford Haemophilia Centre and to the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre, Collindale, there's reference to the Blood Transfusion Research Committee of the Central Blood Laboratories Authority considering the problems. Uh, then there's a, what are the controls on importing blood products? Reference to the uh, Medicines Act. And then, it, this is again, further questions and answers. Is it true that if the government had put more money into the blood products laboratory at an earlier stage, this problem would not now be with us? No, the agent of AIDS is already present in this country since a number of cases of AIDS have been diagnosed in homosexuals who have not received any blood or blood products. When will this country be self-sufficient in blood products? The Central Blood Laboratories Authority is about to embark on a £21 million scheme to build a new blood products laboratory at Elstree. This should be completed in three to four years. We'll be of a size capable of making this country self-sufficient in blood products. Henry, is there anything further on that page? I think there is, no, thank you. So, uh, again... So one of the questions you will no doubt wish to be considering in due course is whether what's said there about the causal connection with blood products was sufficiently reflected in the public statements that were being made by the department or in the approach being taken by uh, haemophilia centre directors such as Professor Bloom. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you to note um, that the following day, the 4th of May 1983, the Haemophilia Society published to its members a document containing Professor Bloom's advice on AIDS. I'm going to come on to that this afternoon uh, when looking uh, uh, at um, 
Professor Bloom at, at his actions and decisions in more focus, but that, that's where it fits into the chronology. It's the 4th of May, 1983. If we could then please have on screen, Henry, DHSC 302227 underscore 020, please. So this is a document you may recall seeing last year, indeed during the evidence of one of the uh, uh, witnesses who gave evidence in Cardiff. It's a communicable disease report for, in relation to the week ending the 6th of May 1983. And you'll see the heading, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, Cardiff. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome has been reported in a 20-year-old man with haemophilia in Cardiff. And, and then there's a reference to the, the infections that he had had for three months, a low T help, helper suppressor ratio, no underly, known underlying cause of immunosuppression. This is the first report of AIDS in a patient with haemophilia in the United Kingdom known to CDSC. Uh, so, a, again, a, a, a key fact in, in the chronology in the course of 1983. Um, that is also immediately notified to the Department of Health, although the documents we've already looked at suggest that the Department of Health, or, or some within the Department of Health, were already aware of it. If we have, please, Henry, um, DHSC 30s, 32s, so 221, please. This is uh, an internal DHSS uh, minute, dated the 6th of May, 1983. Uh, um, AIDS, American Factor 8 is the heading. Dr. Spence Galbraith telephoned from CDSC this morning with the following information. The male patient, patient aged 23 years in Cardiff who is a known haemophiliac now appears to have the right symptoms and signs for a diagnosis of AIDS and reference there to opportunistic infection and so on. He's been ill for a month. He's been treated with factor eight, constant, uh, American factor eight. Um, no further use of the haemophiliac patient in London. Dr. Galbraith last night received information from Spain that three haemophiliac patients there are thought to have AIDS and have also been treated with American factor eight. Uh, Dr. Galbraith asks that the department should consider the matter as a priority and asks that any top level meetings should include CDSC who are collecting all data on AIDS cases for us. I assured him we would liaise with CDSC and also told him we'd already met Dr. Gunson, CA in blood transfusion, and he was in touch with regional transfusion directors and that alternative supplies of factor eight are being considered but are not going to be easy to come by. The matter's under active uh, consideration. Swiss supplies are considered doubtful. Is Germany a possibility? Uh, so again, a, a, a direct communication to the Department of Health um, of not only the Cardiff case but also the cases uh, in Spain. Um, if we then go, please, to CBLA 5043 underscore 040, please, Henry. This is a letter from Dr. Spence Galbraith, uh, who we've just seen referred to in the communication with the DHSS. It's dated 9th of May, so three days later. Um, and it's addressed to Dr. Field at the Department of Health and Social Security. Dear Ian... Last week, while you were away in Geneva, a case of, the, of AIDS in a haemophiliac in Cardiff we'd received USA Factor VIII concentrate was reported. The case fits the recognised criteria for the diagnosis of AIDS. In the Lancet of the 30th of April, three cases to he in haemophiliacs in Spain are reported. I have confirmed that they received USA Factor VIII concentrates. In the same issue of the Lancet, the tally of 11 reported cases in haemophiliacs in the USA is reported and a paper describes a case in a multiply transfused child in the USA. And then he says this, I have reviewed the literature and come to the conclusion that all blood products made from blood donated in the USA after 1978 should be withdrawn from use until the risk of AIDS transmission by these products has been clarified. Attached is a paper in which I set out my reasons for making this proposal. Perhaps the subject could be discussed at an early meeting with haematologists, virologists, and others concerned so that a decision may be made as soon as possible. Uh, and we can see, if we go over the page, um, we see his paper um, setting out his reasons. 
So reasons for withdrawal of USA blood products. One, the AIDS epidemic in the USA is probably due to a transmissible agent. Two, the agent is probably transmitted by blood and blood products. And then he sets out his, um, uh, uh, his reasons for reaching that conclusion and just picking it up towards the bottom of that paragraph. Uh, um, one of these cases, Professor Bloom's case in Cardiff, fits the accepted criteria of AIDS. Uh, three, although this, number of AIDS, uh, although this number of cases of AIDS associated with the administration of factor VIII concentrate is very small in relation to the number of individuals receiving the product, this may not indicate that the risk is small because A, the earliest cases of AIDS reported in the USA developed symptoms in 1978, and therefore USA blood products manufactured from donations before 1978 are very unlikely to have been contaminated. Uh, indeed, the earliest reported date of onset of AIDS in a haemophiliac is October 1980. B, most of the reported cases of AIDS have been diagnosed in 1981 and 1982, and he sets out various numbers. C, the incubation period is long, between several months and two years, maybe as long as four years, and therefore one would not expect to see many cases due to USA blood products until a year or more after 1981-82 donated blood products had been given. So pausing there, sir, you will have seen in a number of documents, and indeed we'll see it in some further documents today, reference made to the incidence, to the number of cases, and the number of cases being small, and that effectively being conflated with the risk. Here, Dr Galbraith is not falling into that error of conflating the two concepts. Well, well he, he, he might, to, to this extent, if you go back to the previous page, um, he, he says the earliest cases of AIDS reported developed symptoms in 1978. Therefore, USA blood products manufactured from donations before 1978 are very unlikely to have been contaminated. But he then goes on to say there's a, an incubation period of seven months or, or so, if one allows uh, a year or so, he ought to have been uh, saying 76 or 77, oughtn't he? Yes, that last part of that sentence may not follow from what he sets out elsewhere in the paragraph. I mean, he's been cautious, but he may not be cautious enough. Yes, uh, but he's certainly uh, um, um, uh, 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 identifying um, that the, the currently known number of cases may not be an accurate reflection of the true extent of risk. It's, it's what's coming out of the tap, not what's in the pipeline. Uh, and then um, he goes on to say, four, factor VIII concentrate in pool products would appear to have a high risk of being contaminated with AIDS agent because homosexuals and drug abusers are known to be frequent blood donors and each plasma pool from which it's manufactured is collected from as many as 1,000 donors. Uh, and, and he refers to the possibility that the AIDS agent being present in the blood of healthy persons for several months before the onset of symptoms. Five, there's apparently no known means of ensuring that blood of blood products are free of the AIDS agent. Uh, and, and again, he refers to the San Francisco baby case. Six, the mortality rate of AIDS exceeds 60% one year after diagnosis and is expected to reach 70%. So those are his reasons for suggesting that action should be taken now to prevent the further use of American imported factor VIII concentrates, uh, which of course we know did not, as a, um, as a matter of fact, happen. Um, we, we go from Dr. Galbraith to an internal, uh, no, sorry, not to an internal, to, to a pharmaceutical company communication to the department, PRSC 304496. This is a letter of the same date, 9th of May 1983, from Travanol to the DHSS. Um, I want to advise you of important developments and actions being taken by Highland Therapeutics and Travanol Laboratories in connection with the risks of AIDS. While the causative agent of this disease remains to be identified, some evidence suggests it is caused by a virus that can be transmitted by blood and certain blood products. And then there's a reference to the March 24th um, directive from the FDA in the States. Uh, and um, uh, um, in, the, in the second paragraph, Highland having become aware that one of its plasma donors had been identified as a possible victim um, of AIDS. Um, and it sets out a, a, a number of... Um, uh, steps um, that uh, Highland was proposing and drawing to the attention of DHSS. But for present purposes, sir, in terms of looking at knowledge of risk, it's really what's said in the first paragraph that I 
um, um, draw to your attention. Um, on the 13th of May, there was a special meeting of the Haemophilia Reference Centre directors, the purpose of which was to discuss recent publicity about AIDS. So I'm going to come back to that when we look at Professor Bloom uh, later on, uh, because uh, he was chair of um, the Haemophilia Centre Directors' Organisation at the time, and it fits neatly into um, a, 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 the account of, of what he was doing. Um, but that was happening at the same time as, uh, as the correspondence that we're seeing. Um, then if we could please have Henry NHBT 2017430, please. This is a report by Dr. Gunson on um, proceedings in Lisbon that had taken place between the 16th and 19th of May 1983 in the Committee of Experts on Blood Transfusion and Immunohematology. Uh, and you can see under the heading of Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, he says this, there is no doubt that this subject dominated the meeting and a report is to be submitted to a meeting of ministers in June 1983. In the next paragraph, he sets out some of um, what has been observed and concludes the disease carries a high mortality rate. Um, there is then a reference to reports by members of, of the incidence of AIDS. Within, within the European countries, with one exception, there were less than 10 cases of AIDS reported from each country. The exception was Belgium, where 15 had been found. And then this. The significance of AIDS to the committee was in relation to the effects with respect to the transfusion of blood and blood products, particularly with coagulation factor concentrates given to patients suffering from haemophilia. Absolute proof that AIDS is caused by a transmissible infectious agent, agent is not yet available, but the consensus in the committee was that it should be regarded as such, and that a recommendation should be made to the Council of Ministers at the meeting in June to take necessary steps to minimise the transmission of AIDS by the transfusion of blood products. Um, so there, sir, we see what's being said at a European level. We what, don't yet what, have... What were the recommendations it went on to make? Um, we'll come to that, I think, sir. Yes, we'll come to that. Um, uh, recommendations were made on the 23rd of June, 1983, so I'll get to that shortly. Um, Around this time, we have Montagnier's report um, in uh, the journal Science of uh, a possible link between AIDS and uh, the virus referred to by him as LAV. Um, I, I don't have any particular documentation I'm proposing to show you in relation to that. Um, DHSC 3038241164, underscore please, Henry. This is a letter dated the 20th of May, 1983. It's from Dr. Richard Tedder of the School of Pathology at the Middlesex Hospital Medical School to Dr. Wolford of the DHSS. Uh, and you'll see it's, a, it's a, 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 essentially a, a recommendation for there to be um, a, a research. Um, uh, but in the second paragraph, he says this, this condition, i.e. AIDS, is likely to be caused by an infectious agent or agents its epidemiology bears a striking similarity to hepatitis B, which was, of course, known and had been known for uh, decades to be transmissible by blood and blood products. Um, Henry, could we then have PRSE 40984? This is... Um, if you turn it round, thank you. Thank you. This is a document dated May 1983. Um, I think we have established it's likely to be um, the, towards the end of May of 1983. Um, it's headed AIDS and blood transfusion, some background to the recent publicity. It's produced by Dr. A. Smith, uh, uh, um, uh, I understand, from the South East Scotland Blood Transfusion Service. He refers to, the, in the, the first paragraph, there's been a lot of publicity about AIDS in the media recently. We thought we should explain something 
about the disease for donors who are worried about, uh, about it. Um, and then further down, there's a question, who can get the disease? AIDS has been occurring, particularly in the USA, in certain people who are apparently susceptible to the disease. And then we have a number listed, and the fifth is haemophiliacs, this is at the top of the middle column, who may be more susceptible or may become infected by their use of blood products, which may have come from a blood donor with AIDS. Has AIDS occurred in the UK? The answer is yes. Does this mean the UK is relatively safe? We do not know. Can it be transmitted by blood transfusion? It appears it can. This might cause the disease in people who are not normally at risk. It may have infected clotting factors that cause AIDS in haemophilic men uh, in USA. We've not had any definite cases of AIDS in haemophilacs in, in the UK. And then this, the disease cannot be taken lightly. Those getting AIDS may die because they are more susceptible to serious infections and cancer due to their impaired immune system. Um, could we then please, Henry, have DHSC three zeros two two three one underscore zero five one? And um, we can see that again, this is part of. Uh, an internal DHSS communications in relation to AIDS. There's reference to there having been a meeting on the 3rd of June. Uh, the document itself, uh, or the minute itself, is dated the 6th of June, 1983. Um, and if we look in paragraph three of that, uh, it says that Dr. Wolford, who's the author of this minute, has written a paper for Dr. Harris to accompany an agenda item for the CBLA C attached sheet B. If we could go, please, Henry, to the third page of this document, we can see the, the paper authored by Dr. Wolford. Possible implications of AIDS for plasma supply and manufacturers, manufacture at BPL. There are increasing indications that the uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome may be transmitted by blood and blood products. Because of the number of donations to which they're exposed, haemophiliacs receiving large pool factor eight concentrates such as that manufactured at BPL might be at greater risk than those receiving single donor cryoprecipitate or small pool products. Uh, and references made there to the Council of Europe meeting. Um, Henry, if we then have please PRSE 302741. Sorry, I think I may have given you the wrong reference. No, don't worry, I'm, I'm, I may come back to that. That's a, an, another version of Dr. Gunson's report. It's an updated version of Dr. Gunson's report. Um, if we have, please... Um, no, I think I might have, in fact, given you the right one. Sorry, PRSC 302741. Thank you. It was the right one. Um, this is the CBLA meeting, 21st of June, 1983. We can see attendees include Dr. Gunson, Professor Bloom, Dr. Ritzer, um, and um, uh, Representative Dr. Bell from the Scottish Home and Health Department, Dr. Gibson from the Medical Research Council, Dr. Wolford from the DHSS. Uh, and if we just go to the bottom of that page, please. Under the heading... AIDS, the chairman outlined the problems caused by AIDS since it appeared to be transmitted through blood and blood products, then it should be considered by the committee. Uh, I think we, we may not be on the same, the same part of the page ah. on the screen. Can we just, um, yes. Henry, can we check that we are in the right place, please? Yes, I think, I, think, I think we are. So it was the very bottom of the first page, the very last line of the first page. Thank you. That's where we need to be. Thank yeah, you. The chairman outlined the problems caused by AIDS since it appeared, and then we go to the next page, to be transmitted through blood and blood products, then it should be considered by the committee. <clears throat> and then there are various discussions about research um, and um, consideration by the transfusion committee. But then you, you, you'll see there, sir, that the CBLA um, 
seemingly accepting um, the causal connection between blood and blood products and AIDS and certainly not advancing any alternative uh, cause. Uh, then, Henry, if we could have PRSE 40372. This is the Council of Europe Committee of uh, Ministers recommendations, 23rd of June 1983. Um, if we go down to the third paragraph, considering the growing importance of a new and severe health hazard AIDS that may be caused by an infectious agent transmissible by blood and blood products. And then if we go to the next page, please, Henry. Recommends the governments of member states, one, to take all necessary steps and measures with respect to AIDS, and in particular to avoid, wherever possible, the use of coagulation factor products prepared from large plasma pools. This is especially important for those countries where self-sufficiency in the production of such products has not yet been achieved, to inform attending physicians and selected recipients such as haemophiliacs of the potential health hazards of haemotherapy and the possibilities of minimising these risks, and then thirdly, to provide all blood donors with information on AIDS so that those in risk groups will refrain from donating. Does it give a, a definition of what large plasma pools are? Uh, certainly not in this document. I, I, I haven't put before you, sir, all the material relating to the Council of Europe meeting. Um, there were reports from a number of different European countries. We, we, we do, I think, have much of the material, so we can check um, um, what the position was there. But you'll see there, sir, um, in relation to the first two recommendations... The overall arching recommendation is to take all necessary steps and measures, but in particular, the two is to avoid, wherever possible, the use of factor products prepared from large plasma pools and to inform physicians and recipients, in other words, patients, of the potential health hazards and the possibilities of minimising the risks. And again, one of the key questions for you, sir, will be, in particular, evaluating the evidence you've heard from individuals, whether clinicians uh, uh, did provide information or warnings about, about the risk of AIDS uh, to their patients. And, and, and no doubt you'll be assisted to by the evidence you'll hear from clinicians on that issue over the coming months. Um, without going to it, um, uh, so 24th of June 1983, there's a further MMWR publication from the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta um, updating uh, uh, um, the increasing num numbers of cases of AIDS, 1,641 now reported in the USA and its territories. Um, we then will get to HCDO 40270 underscore 004. Again, this is a document we'll no doubt come back to um, um, possibly in, in relation to Professor Bloom or in relation to, to, to Oxford and Dr Ritzer. It's dated the 24th of June, 1983. Um, it's a doctor, it's a, it says dear blank, but it was, we know from other material it was sent to the Haemophilia Centre Directors um, following the meeting of reference centre directors held on the 13th of May, 1983. Um, it says so far one possible case has been reported to our organisation, that is presumably the Cardiff case. Uh, this patient conforms to the definition published by the CDC but cannot be considered as a definite case, not aware of any other definable patients amongst the UK haemophilic population. And then it refers to the, the general recommendations agreed on the 13th of May for mildly affected patients with haemophilia A or von Willebrand's disease and minor lesions, treatment with DDABP <coughs> should be considered. Because of the increased risk of transmitting hepatitis by means of large pool concentrates in such patients, this is in any case the usual practice of many directors. Two, for treatment of children and mildly affected patients or patients unexposed to imported concentrates, many directors already reserve supplies of NHS concentrates, cryoprecipitate or freeze-dried, and it would be circumspect to continue this policy. It was agreed that there is as yet insufficient evidence to warrant restriction of the use of imported concentrates in other patients in view of the immense benefits of therapy, but the situation will be constantly reviewed. Uh, uh, and um, then it goes on to deal with treatment of patients with haemophilia B. 
uh, it, where it said it seems logical to continue to use our normal supplies of NHS concentrate. And then it uh, looks at um, proposed trials in relation to hepatitis reduced factor eight concentrates. So again, so one of the many questions that you will need to consider in due course is whether this was an adequate and appropriate response uh, to um, the developing knowledge of the risk of AIDS for haemophiliacs. Uh, and indeed, whether the advice that was set out here in such terms as it is was, was uh, um, uh, implemented by clinicians in centres across the country. Um, we, could we then please have DHSC 301209, please, Henry? This is a document prepared for a key meeting on the 13th of July 1983 of a subcommittee of the Committee on the Safety of Medicines. This is a suggested agenda for the meeting. Um, you'll see um, it's said at one that the aim of the discussion is to help the subcommittee to formulate advice to the CSM on whether any action is needed and if so, what action in respect of AIDS and blood products licensed under the Medicines Act. We can see at two that, that there have been a number invited to attend the subcommittee, including Professor Bloom, but also Dr. Krask, Dr. Galbraith, Dr. Gunson, and Dr. Mortimer. Uh, and then at four, it says, this agenda suggests headings for the discussion and a suggested first speaker is given. As a target for discussion, brief possible conclusions are indicated. Doubtless, these will be changed radically. It, it, it is a somewhat unusual document because it under the heading agenda, it, it sets out suggested conclusions. Um, and if we go down the page, um, we see under the heading factor eight and other clotting factors, etiology, current possibilities, conclusion, an infectious cause seems likely and a single new agent could be responsible. Repeated exposure to or reactivation of known viruses cannot be excluded. Although possible agents have been proposed, their relationship to the disease remains very uncertain. The infectivity of the supposed agent appears to be low, requiring for transmission intimate contact or introduction into the body tissues. And then epidemiology, current position, assessment of risk from factor A, if we go over the page. Conclusion, recipients of clotting factor concentrates are at risk. The degree of risk cannot yet be quantified. The risk is likely to be greatest from products derived from the blood of homosexuals and IV drug abusers resident in areas of high incidence and in those who repeatedly receive concentrates in high dosage. Uh, and then uh, um, the next part goes on to look at possible approaches to avoiding or reducing the presence of viruses in clotting factor preparation, including screening of donors, screening of donor blood, um, um, and a, a number of other matters. One of which is, and this is on the third page, please, Henry, for consideration of the different operational possibilities for reducing the risks from clotting factor preparations. Withdraw factor eight and nine concentrates, i.e. use only cryoprecipitate for treatment. And we're to, it looks like it's suggested Professor Bloom will be the one to address the committee on that. Conclusion. This step cannot at present be recommended. A, it's probably impossible to satisfy UK needs in this way. B, even if needs could be satisfied, it would involve a major rethink of UK policy for preparing blood products. C, the perceived level of risk at present does not justify serious consideration of this solution. And then the next suggestion is withdraw US preparations from the UK market. Conclusion, impracticable on grounds of supply. And then the next suggestion is use US blood products as sparingly as possible. Note, this possibility is largely a matter for physicians treating haemophilia, but it could in theory be decided to modify product licenses, e.g. not for use in children with mild haemophilia. And again, it looks like that's going to be a matter on which Professor Bloom is going to be asked to advise the committee. Conclusion, the uncertain balance of risk slash benefit considerations in various categories of patients are too finely balanced to justify action via licensing the matter should be left to clinical judgment. Um, so those are, that's, the, that's the, the agenda with suggested conclusions. Um, we um, then, uh, before we get to the CSM meeting itself, because this document I think is, is produced, it's 28th of June, 
um, uh, of 1983 for a meeting that was going to take place on the 13th of July. So dealing with matters in strict chronological order, the next relevant event is on the 29th of June, a meeting of the World Federation of Haemophilia General Assembly. Henry, could we have PRSC 301351, please? Um, if we go to the third page, the recommendations here um, are um, set out there. The medical board reached agreement on two issues and wished to advise the council and general assembly accordingly. There is insufficient evidence to recommend at the present any change in treatment. Therefore, present treatment of haemophilia should continue with whatever blood products are available according to the judgment of the individual physician. Two longitudinal studies are urgently needed on the questions already mentioned. Um, so that was the um, recommendation uh, being uh, made by the medical board to the Council and General Assembly of the World Federation of Haemophilia at the end of <coughs> June. There is an interesting reflection on that meeting. If we go to ARCH 30s, 2544, please. Um, this is a note from Dr. Foster, 15th of July, 1983. Might be helpful if I summarize the key points concerning AIDS from the WFH, so World Federation for Haemophilia, and ISTH Stockholm meetings. Most of the information was presented by Dr. Evert. Um, uh, we can skip down the next few paragraphs. Um, we can see six haemophiliacs are in the group which develops opportunistic infections. Seven for haemophiliacs, there are 16 confirmed cases in the USA, eight now dead, five in Europe, three Spain, one Wales, one Canada. Not quite sure why it's thought that Canada's in Europe. Other delegates seem to think there were more cases than this outside USA, e.g. Canada, Germany, Israel, Sweden. Um, uh, um, of the 16 USA cases, one is a mild haemophilia B case who also received two units of New York blood. Haemophilia A cases are mild, moderate, and severe. If we go to the next page. Um, AIDS is still located mainly in key urban areas in the USA. However, the haemophilia cases are generally located in non-AIDS areas. This is strong evidence for transmission by factor VIII. Uh, paragraph 11, the A team of Filiac in Cardiff has received products from Armour and Immuno as well as NHS. Other suspected European cases have received products from Highland and uh, Immuno. Uh, and then this, this is Dr. Foster's impression. My general impression was that there was a con concentrated attempt from USA delegates to play down the situation. The risk to haemophiliacs was said a number of times to be one in a million, though simple arithmetic suggests one in 1,000. Uh, it was stressed that the causes of death for USA haemophiliacs is bleeding 36%, AIDS 11%, cancer 11%, heart disease 7%, i.e. keep on taking concentrates. Uh, um, uh, and then if we just go a little further down, with the first haemophiliac case only 12 months ago and a possible incubation period from one to three years, a number of delegates, mainly European, were clearly uneasy and felt that we may still only um, still be only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, so there is an, perhaps an insight, perhaps, into some of the discussions that informed the recommendations, sir, that we, we just looked at. Um, and then if we could have, please, PRSC 302301. Um, this is... Uh, a publication called Transfusion International. It's a newsletter from the League of Red Cross Societies, uh, and it's from July of 1983. If we go to the second page, we see under the heading AIDS, new concern for blood transfusionists. If we go to the right-hand column. How does this concern blood transfusion services, blood bank directors, blood donor recruiters? There is relatively strong evidence indicating that the disease may be transmitted by blood. 
and then reference to the, the, the 11 cases so far in the US and additional cases in Europe. There is a suspicion that commercial factor eight concentrate prepared from large pools of US plasma has been the source of infection. Although there's no absolute proof that blood really does transmit eight infection, there is one case where the causal relationship is highly suggestive, uh, and we come back to the, uh, um, um, uh, what I think is the San Francisco baby uh, case. Um, so their warnings being given in, uh, in relation to uh, transfusion more generally. And then if we could have, please, NHBT, two zeros, and then 20668, please. Oh, NHBT 0020668. Thank you. So, so you'll see this is from a Dr. Wagstaff um, of the Regional Transfusion Centre in Sheffield. Dear colleague, AIDS leaflet, it's dated the 6th of July 1983. Uh, I'm enclosing a copy of the final form of the leaflet which you'll see has been altered from the original only in the manner of presentation. The majority of RTDs, regional transfusion directors, still feel strongly that approach to donors should be at the lowest key possible and were correspondingly reluctant to either hand the leaflet to every donor at a session or send it out as part of the call-up material. However, one or two regions felt there might be some benefit in a slightly more aggressive approach. And these RTDs may be asked to run a kind of trial in their regions by either posting or handing out the leaflets. And then we look at the leaflet itself, and it's instructive to see what it says. Next page, please, Henry. Why is a leaflet on AIDS necessary? Recently, there's been considerable publicity in the newspapers, etc., etc. What is AIDS? Who is at risk of AIDS? And then if we keep going down, please. Has AIDS occurred in the United Kingdom? Yes, a few cases has been reported. And then this. Can AIDS be transmitted by transfusion of blood and blood products? Almost certainly, yes. There is only the most remote chance of this happening with ordinary blood transfusions. However, in the USA, about 10 patients suffering from haemophilia have developed AIDS. Uh, uh, um, and, and it refers to the use of factor eight. Should just one of the donors be suffering from AIDS, then factor eight could transmit the disease. But you have there, sir, the straightforward answer to a straightforward question. Can it be transmitted by transfusion of blood and blood products? Almost certainly, yes. Um, we'll just see how that leaflet was being considered by within the Department of Health briefly. It's DHSC 301511. We can see this is a meeting on the 6th of July 1983. Present MSH, that's the Minister of State for Health, then Kenneth Clark and Lord Glen Arthur, uh, and then three others within the department. Uh, MSH, so the minister had two main concerns, to establish the necessity of a leaflet and to agree how the inevitable publicity surrounding it should be handled. Officials felt that ministers did not have the option of doing nothing. The main objective of the leaflet was to discourage those who were at most risk from AIDS from giving blood and thereby spreading the infection to patients who needed large amounts of blood, principally haemophiliacs. And then it refers to similar guidance from the American Blood Transfusion Service and the recommendation from the Council of Europe that we've looked at. Uh, moreover, one of the regional transfusion directors had let slip to the press that a leaflet was in the offing, and if nothing was now done, speculation would be rife. Pausing there, sir, there doesn't appear to be any doubt expressed in this minute of the existence of the causal relationship. The question is only, should a leaflet be issued? Is that the appropriate course, rather than... Um, it being suggested that uh, th there's insufficient evidence that AIDS was transmitted through blood or blood products. Um, and then we see the minister's response at 3, MSH accepted the strength of these arguments. He thought the leaflet is drafted read well, although he would like it to emphasise more strongly how few cases of AIDS there had been in the UK, perhaps by quoting numbers. And then there's reference to Lord Glen Arthur would be answering an oral parliamentary question about AIDS from Baroness Dudley on the 14th of July, if she asked about the blood transfusion service, Lord Glen Arthur should emphasise that the risk to haemophiliacs was very small. Uh, I, I appreciate we're, we're looking at, at risk at the moment, uh, but the 
the, un the subtext of this meeting seems to be that it, the leaflet itself was saying to people who were in particular risk groups that they shouldn't give blood. Yes. Can we go back to the leaflet? Yes, certainly. That is NHBT 0020668. Does it actually say anywhere in the leaflet that people who are uh, homosexual men who've had many different partners or drug addicts and sexual contacts of people suffering from AIDS should not give blood. The way it's put is in under the, the, the question at the bottom of the page, how can risks be reduced? At present, there's no screening test the transfusion service can use to detect people with AIDS. So until there is and until more is known about this disease, donors are requested not to give blood if they think they might either have the disease or be at risk from it. So it's not particularly specific, is it? No, although it's fair to say that the, the categories of those who appear to be particularly susceptible is set out above under the heading who's at risk of AIDS. And we see there gay men with many different partners, drug addicts using injections, sexual contacts of people suffering from AIDS. But yes, it, it's, a, it's a request rather than an injunction. And it, it obliges the person to say, oh, I'm at risk. It's to self-identify effectively, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, so I should say that there is other evidence which suggests that the leaflet was in due course published um, in early September 1983. Um, and then if we could have, please, DHSC 301208. And this is probably the last document before we break. Um, this is um, a, a report of the, the, the meeting that took place the um, in the committee, the subcommittee of the Committee of the Safety of Medicines on the 13th of July, 1983. We do also have the minutes. I'm not going to put them up. If anyone wants them, they are at ARCH 301710. But actually, the minutes, in, in terms of content, don't really say anything more than, than what we have here. Summary of main points from a consideration of AIDS and licensed blood products by CSMV, 13 July, 1983. The subcommittee was helped by the following expert advisors, Professor Bloom and Dr. Krask, Dr. Galbraith, Dr. Gunson um, uh, and Dr. Mortimer. Consideration was given to the current information available on incidents and epidemiology, etiology and related factors. Strategies for limiting or eliminating risks from blood products were examined together with possible practical measures. The following conclusions were reached. One, the cause of AIDS is unknown, but an infectious etiology seems likely. A previously unrecognized or new agent may be responsible. Uh, heightened susceptibility may be an important factor based on the, um, sorry, I, sh I should complete that sentence, e.g. immunological deficiencies induced by unusual sexual practices or exposure to blood products. Uh, two, patients who repeatedly receive blood clotting factor concentrates appear to be at risk but the evidence so far available suggests that this risk is small. The risk appears to be greatest in the case of products derived from the blood of homosexuals and IV drug abusers resident in areas of high incidence, e.g. New York and California, and in those who repeatedly receive concentrates in high dosage. Balanced against the risks of AIDS and of other infections transmitted by blood products are the benefits of their use. In the case of haemophilia, they are life-saving. The possibility was considered of withdrawing clotting factor concentrates from the market and replacing them with cryoprecipitate. It was concluded that this was, is not feasible in the UK on grounds of supply. Uh, and then um, the um, uh, note goes through effectively the various other options um, that were considered at the meeting. Um, so obviously this is a document you will return to, I have no doubt, on a number of occasions. Uh, so I won't um, go through it in... Um, in, in detail at this stage. But we'll see that the possibility was considered withdrawing US preparations from the UK. This is point four. Uh, it was concluded that wasn't feasible on grounds of supply and that the perceived level of risk didn't at present justify serious consideration of such a solution. Uh, um, th there was consideration of the position in relation to pre and post March 23rd of 1983 supply in paragraph five. Uh, um, viral inactivation is considered as a promising future development in point six. Um, 
considerations given to uh, hep the hepatitis B vaccine uh, um, and others. And then at 11 concludes there's a need for research work on AIDS in the UK. But as I say, you'll, you'll, you'll no doubt look at that, sir, um, uh, um, with witnesses in due course. Um, what we... Uh, well, in fact, so we've reached 11 o'clock or just gone 11 o'clock. So before I move to another document, that may be a convenient point at which to finish. Well, that, that would be a convenient moment. Um, we break off at the position in which the subcommittee is recommending uh, that there be no, no ban on the importation. Yes. Very well. Uh, well, we come back, uh, as always, uh, three quarters of an hour to make sure you have time uh, to go socially distanced to pick up the, uh, the coffee, or to be served with the coffee, or, or whatever you have. Um, I look forward to seeing you back here uh, at quarter to twelve.